Welcome everyone. There are a great many health and medical titles to introduce our next powerhouse Little Star Lighting guest. First and foremost, Dr. David Agus cares about people, all people. He cares about their health, wellness, and quality of life. Dr. Agus wants everyone to have a happier, healthier, and more fulfilling life. As for achievements, these are just a few. Dr. Agus is the founding director and CEO of the Lawrence J. Ellison Institute for Transformative Medicine, based in Los Angeles and the University of Oxford. Dr. Agus is also a professor of medicine and engineering at the University of Southern California, an international leader in new technologies and approaches for personalized healthcare and wellness. And he also serves in leadership roles at the World Economic Forum. Additionally, he is a CBS News contributor. Dr. Agus' specialty as a medical oncologist leads a multidisciplinary team of researchers dedicated to the development and use of technologies to guide doctors in making healthcare decisions tailored to individual needs. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Dr. Agus. Thank you, Andrea. Congratulations on your incredible accomplishments. The vastness of your knowledge, you can probably have a medical competition with Google and win. <laughs> what helped your excellence in learning using and retaining enormous amounts of data for purposeful and important research and patient care? You know, the real answer to this is actually fear. Um, you know, when a patient puts their life into your hands, there's a fear that you're not going to do the right thing. And so that's what drives me. I know it's a little weird to say, but it's really the fear of making the wrong decision and not knowing something where I can help them. And so it really has driven me to get better and to bring on teams to help me so we can achieve the best in outcomes for all of our patients. Okay. Now you're also a physician, teacher, and researcher. In your books and leadership positions, you fulfill those roles while also enjoying being a student. CEOs can skip that student part. You don't. How do you nurture your appreciation of learning and sense of wonder with such a busy life? You know, it's an amazing time, right? All of a sudden, we now have new treatments for cancer, new ways of diagnosing and understanding disease that literally were science fiction uh, years ago. And so we now can use your immune system to attack cancer. We can edit DNA. And so, you know, the drive to learn about these and then apply them, the great advances in my field in medicine have come from something in another field and applying it here. So how could you not be curious and excited about learning about everything going on now? Look what's happening in artificial intelligence. It is wild. You know, we used to make antibodies to treat cancer. And that took several years to make. But now with something called large language models, where you treat every amino acid in an antibody like a word in a sentence, all of a sudden we could do it in hours with supercomputers. So the field is changing and you have to be in awe and a student in order to appreciate it and gain from it. Absolutely. Now, your books have relatable lessons backed by scientific data to help people from all walks of life. Your most recent book is the book of Animal Secrets, Nature's Lessons for a Long and Happy Life. Re-release edits are part of that. In it, you mention the importance of check your hearing, have an eye exam, and go to the dentist regularly. Common things, but so often people get busy and put off appointments. In your, book, in your book, you share deeper reasons why those types of appointments can totally improve a person's life way beyond what they just seem as eye, hearing, you know, th those types of things. Could you elaborate on that? Because in checking your hearing, we might think, oh, we want our parents to check that. You know, we want our, the elderly part. It's not just for the elderly. This is something that's really important. And you mentioned that. And, and that's what's so great about your books. You give some things that we might think are, are common but we're reminded of the deep importance of it that can change your life now. Don't wait till way later. You know, look at these things now. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. I mean, it's, it's kind of wild, right? Your parents in general didn't sit at rock concerts all day and lose their hearing. The next generations have as amplitude of sound goes up and up. And what we see very simply is that as hearing goes down, feelings of loneliness and depression go up. And so one of the ways you can really engage socially is by having intact hearing. And so we're seeing newer generations now with all these devices in their ears and you know being exposed to loud noises, which are making hearing loss happen much earlier. And you also, I mean, it's the coolest thing is the current administration, the Biden administration are making hearing aids over the counter. So instead of requiring a doctor and costing many thousands of dollars, 
that technology can cost a very small amount and really is available to everybody at every stage of hearing loss to enable them to have a more quality life, which is what it's all about. You look at things like taking care of your teeth, obviously important. You know, when you look at people over the age of 80, you ask them, what would you have done differently in health? The uniform answer is take care of, pick care of my feet and my teeth because they want to eat better and they want to enjoy food. At the same time, gum disease affects heart. And so the more gum disease you have, the more you know decaying or cavities you have, the more your risk for heart disease is as you increase in years later in life. And so I want you to really take care of these things now to prevent disease later. And it's kind of wild how we only pay attention in our country when something bad happens, right? You go to the doctor when all of a sudden I can't hear my spouse talking or something like that. I want you to go early and identifying things so we can head it off at the pass and maybe you do wear earplugs now when you go to a concert because you've got some degree of hearing loss now rather than waiting later when it's a major problem. That is what's so great about you is, is you're about, let me take care of you before you have to come see me. It's you know, when there's a problem that has happened. It's the preventative part that's really excellent. Um, also, you have great passion for patient care, every patient. You have celebrity clients and non-famous clients, and you treat each person with your best. Your humbleness is lived with confidence. In my caring for children with cancer and each of the demographics of suffering kids, families, and communities I help, it requires as best I can an understanding of their world. There are tough, even brutal days and seasons, whether due to patient sufferings going on or fundraising frustrations. But because I know I am serving a greater good to make a difference, I get up each day inspired what can be accomplished. You live a life of service with passion sharing with the world your own experiences of joy, wisdom, and gratitude. If you were mentoring your younger self, anything you would say or change? You know, um, I think about that a lot. What would I have done differently? And I think, you know, most of us have a passion for what we want to do in life. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a tennis player. I want to be, you know, an engineer. I want to be a, a teacher. And those are all great. But when we really look at people who are successful, it's the broad background. So I wish I took broader courses at university in an early level. I wish I learned more about advanced math, about physics, about other areas, because those skills applied to my field would really help. And I'll tell you, and I think you probably know this, at, at my age now, trying to go back and learn physics and advanced math and artificial intelligence is a lot harder than it would have been had I done it when I was a late teenager or university or others. Um, so I wish I had that broader education. You know, you look at most of the big advances and very exciting new companies, they're coming out of our country. And it's because our education system, our colleges, really force a broad background. They teach, make you learn a language. They make you learn uh, uh, philosophy and art and things that at the time you say, why do I have to do this requirement? You know, I look back and that's why we are so successful in our country. Many other countries, most in Europe, you choose a profession literally out of high school. And so our learning more is uh, uh, certainly why we're successful. I want that to be even greater. And I wish I took more advantage of it. <laughs> great insights. Great. Now, Karen and Adriana are excited to join the conversation as well. Karen, what would you like to share? Hi, Dr. Agus. It's a pleasure meeting you. Um, I did read your book. It was pretty good. Um, not much a reader, but I love reading your book. <laughs> uh, so in chapter 11, it talks about pain and how we can learn to manage it. You mentioned that having an optimistic attitude can have a positive influence on the course and experience of pain. And as a doctor, this also is approach that you use by being optimistic with your patients. Now, give them a false hope but by educating them about the possibilities of treating their disease. I believe that that's, that approach does work. Um, as you know, I'm a um, I'm a, a child child a leukemia childhood survivor. So um, when I was 11, I was diagnosed with um, leukemia, and um, the doctors, you know, they would be try to be positive. I had a very very bad prognosis, a two percent uh, chance of living. So. Um, the doctors, you know, they kept me optimistic. They helped me. And I think, I believe, as children, we tend to be more, like, naturally optimistic. I believe that that's what helped us through the pain and our chances of survival. Now, thank God I'm here, and um, I survived. I had a 
bone marrow transplant uh, by my brother. So uh, that's my chances of living today. So um, as a doctor, now, when you lose a patient, how do you handle the pain, the grief that brings? You know, the you didn't really mention that, but pain is also part of like an emotional, I don't know if, if pain, I don't know if it hurts more emotionally or physically, but I guess yeah. they're both linked. But as a doctor, when you lose a patient, what helps um, you handle the pain or the grief? Well, first of all, Karen, congrats to you for not just you know getting through the leukemia, but for thriving Thank and for you. talking about it and demystifying it for others. I mean, obviously that word diagnosis of cancer, everybody has a panic. And mm -hmm. the more people like you talk about it, the better they're going to do, the more optimistic they're going to be. And you're right, you know, having an optimistic attitude or a belief system, you do 30% better in all clinical trials across all diseases. That's a dramatic number. You know, unfortunately, I lose patients um, on a regular cadence and it's horrible. Every single one, there's a grief for me and I can only imagine what the families are going through and obviously the suffering the patient had. But I have to look at it in two ways. One is I, I enable them to live longer and better. And so that gives me a feedback loop to keep me going. I look at it and say, you know, they were diagnosed and they had cancer, but I was able to keep them alive with a good quality of life for a year, three years, five years, whatever it is. And that's where I get that feedback loop. At the same time, I do something that you're going to give me weird looks on and I apologize, <laughs> but I do autopsies in all of my patients. And I need to learn and want to learn where I went wrong. And I have to learn to get better. And it's really emotional and hard. And I'm in tears half the time because I've known this person maybe for a decade or more. And I have to do their autopsy together with a pathologist and try to figure out that scar tissue in the lung. It really was an infection, although I didn't think it was, or it was cancer. And that's why they had trouble breathing. And it was so thin, the layer of cells that I couldn't see it on a scan but it was there and that's how I can get better. So I have to look at every patient who unfortunately succumbs to a disease as a way for me to get better. And at the same time, I have to, you know, in order to survive psychologically, I have to think and say, how did I help them live better? Because that's the feedback loop that get, makes me able to do it again and again and again. Wow. So the saying that uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is actually true. <laughs> um, so. Um, what helpful words would you share with heartbroken parents? You know, obviously, whenever you lose a child to a disease, it is one of the most difficult things, and it wasn't meant to happen. And we're certainly getting better, right? You know, you yeah. have 15,000 to 16,000 cases of childhood cancer under the age of you know 16 a year, and only 1,000 deaths a year. So we are getting better at this horrible disease, but we're certainly not in a position where we can cure everybody. And you know the medical field has failed and we have failed these parents and we have obviously failed the child and we need to get better. You know We're a country that is addicted to all kinds of things. We spend more on potato chips in our country than we do on cancer research. And so we have to get better at really inlining incentives and using resources to improve what we do and focus on the cure of these diseases. And so I apologize to every parent who lost a child because we in the medical field should and can and will do better. Thank you for sharing that. Now, when I was reading your book, it shows that you did a lot of research into the lives of these animals and insects that you mentioned, which had me thinking, what led you to study these animals and connect it to humans? <laughs> it's pretty cool, right? Is that we've all been on this for a million years, all the animal creatures and we humans. And we've had the same pressures and we've all adapted differently. So, you know, it really came about where I was on safari with our family in Africa, which is the coolest trip ever, right? You're going back in time and watching animals, how they were supposed to be just walking around. And I was with the guide and an elephant walks by. And I look at the guide, I go, you know, listen, these creatures, they're amazing. They're 40 times bigger than humans. 40 to 100 times more cells. So they must have gobs of cancer because every time a cell divides, you can get make a, a fault, a mutation and get cancer. So elephants must have lots of cancer. He looked at me and goes, no, elephants don't get cancer. I said, what, how can that be? 
And so, you know, I, I looked into it and it turns out you and I have a gene called P53, which we call the guardian of the genome. It's a gene that corrects error in DNA. So we don't have inflammation causing problems in our DNA and yielding cancer. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. In fact, most cancers have this gene turned off. That's how they become a cancer. Well, every elephant on every continent has 20 copies of this gene, and we have one. So all of a sudden, these elephants evolved a way not to get cancer. Why? Probably because, you know, by the time you and I hit 30 throughout evolution, we've had our children already. And in fact, the longer we live, the more food and housing we take from that next generation. Elephant females give birth until their 70s. The dominant male protects the herd until the day he dies. So they couldn't afford to get cancer, whereas it was kind of built in to knock us off in our 50s, our 60s, or 70s, so that next generation can live better. So all of a sudden, here's something from an elephant we can learn from and maybe prevent all cancers. And so I looked at that and said, I want to learn more. So I went and met experts at all of different animals, from uh, uh, the elephants to the giraffes, to the ants, to the whales, to all of these different creatures. And so here are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer, longevity. What can I learn from your system? And the answers have been amazing. Yeah, I was like amazed because I'm like, I want to be an animal instead. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, from your research into these animals, which one did you learn and relate it, relate it to the most? You know, the coolest to me, I know, again, you're going to give me weird looks, and I know I keep doing this to you, <laughs> but it was the ants. Ants, okay. You know, I talked to this ants expert, and by the way, an ant expert is a strange individual in general. <laughs> <laughs> but he was in, he's from Germany, and he was telling me that he left his family to go to Africa to study these ant colonies. The way they identify the queen ant is pretty cool. First of all, they identify her through behavior, and they follow the ant colony for many weeks, and identify who the queen is, and they put white out. You may be even too young to remember what white out is, but it was when you, you know, you used to type and you made an error, you used to use white out and then type over it. They, they paint her back with it. And so what they realize is, first of all, that queen ant lives on average about 55 to 56 years. And the worker ants, she gives birth to all the workers. So same genetics, they live six months. So what's the difference in the lifestyle between the queen ant and the worker ants? Pretty wild. And then he was telling me, I said, what's the most important discovery you made? He said, you know, I, I was driving to my ant colony. And then all of a sudden, my son called from Germany. He was in a soccer game. And he fell and he actually broke his leg. And I felt so bad I wasn't there and I wasn't a good parent that I didn't pay attention. And I rode over the ant colony and I killed a lot of my subjects. I go, that's your greatest discovery? He goes, well, what I figured out is that when an ant hurts three or more legs and can't use them, they leave them on the battlefield to die. But when it's two or less, they bring them back, they lick the wounds because they have a natural anti-effective in their saliva. And there's a 94% survival. So the ants have a triage system. In fact, when an ant gets a virus, what they do is they stay away from the colony for two weeks. And if they survive, they come back and live a normal life. If they don't, they don't, they die outside of the colony and they don't let any other ant get sick. And it was pretty amazing that they have these behaviors that we can learn from. Mm. That's true. We're like, kind of like humanistic too. So, wow, that is, that is so interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, Karen. Now, up next is Adriana. And it's interesting, Dr. Agus, when you said at the beginning about taking um, some different courses and when Adriana, she grew up similar to I did, training very hard in tennis. She did play professional tennis, but she also played D1 college tennis. When she was on a scholarship there, they didn't let her take art courses. She's now, they wouldn't, they said, nope, those are too expensive for the school. You're on a scholarship. You don't get those. And now she helps being an art therapist person for kids in orphanages, children with cancer, blind children. She's taught art to blind children. And, and so it's so interesting how you said that. But anyway, here, here's Adriana. Hi, Dr. Agus. It is wonderful to be on the podcast with you. Thank you for being with us. I thoroughly enjoyed reading your most recent book, The Book of Animal Secrets, Nature's Lessons for a Long and Happy Life. I learned a lot. In summary, you hope the book might change not only how we think and live each day, but also how we lead, parent, work, teach, 
make decisions, love, play, collaborate, create, relate with others, strangers included, deal with challenges, forgive, in, be in the present moment, and more. The book isn't just about all the incredible things we can learn from nature and animals who are the more experienced earth dwellers. It's also a guide to all the ways we can affect our health, our well-being, and even our longevity through simple lifestyle changes. I enjoyed reading about how our genes are not our fate. The book cites an amazing study showing that how long your mother-in-law lives is a better predictor how long you live than what's in your genes. The book states this is because we tend to share the lifestyle of those we marry and how our lifestyle can actually change uh, our DNA through epigenetics, which is about how our behaviors and environment can cause molecular changes in our DNA that affect the way our genes work. Can you elaborate on that? And can you perhaps give a specific example how these changes might happen in a beneficial way for someone? Sure, Andrana. And first of all, thank you for what you do. It's amazing. You know, my institute here, art is a big part of it. You know, when you walk in, we have the Robert Indiana Sculpture of Hope, because my job really is to bring hope to people. If I just told you that elephant story, well, Jeff Koons made a 26-foot-tall elephant in the building. Oh, wow. So every kid comes by, and we tell them the story while they're looking at a sculpture by the amazing artist Jeff Koons of an elephant. Yes, that's incredible. Oh. And so, And we have many, many other pieces that, you know, really reflect art. And, you know, the way I look at things and, the, you know, my career now, our institute is about different disciplines. Mm -hmm. I want artists to come into our building because they think and approach the same problems I face in a different way. And they think about it differently and they can explain things. And what better way than through art to tell the stories and explain science to either that next generation or my peers. Um, you know, the genetic study you referred to was amazing. It was actually done by Google and Ancestry.com. And, and it's pretty wild, right? Your genetics mm -hmm. is probably five, six, seven percent of your longevity. The rest is your behavior. And you know, you're right, is that we marry people of similar uh, traits. So, you know, if you're a smoker, you tend to marry a smoker. If you're a couch potato, you tend to marry a couch potato. If you're a someone who listens to doctors and actually follows prevention, you normally marry somebody who respects doctors too and listens to what they say. And so because of that, those traits we normally get from our parents, right? And so when your parents smoked all the time, many times you were a smoker. And so our mother-in-law, your spouse's mother, um, her life expectancy is probably more correlated or is more correlated than your DNA is. And so it's pretty wild, that behavior. And to me, that was the most empowering study because it made that our future is in our own hands. It's not something we're born with. It's something we can actually control. And so that is positive, right? You are in charge of your future. So you can decide, I want to do everything I can to prevent bad things from happening. I want to live a healthy lifestyle rather than just saying, hey, whatever happens, happens. No matter what I do, you know, this is a foregone conclusion. So that to me really brings power to each of us and we need to act on it. And so it really means being educated is that things you do today are gonna matter tomorrow, a decade, three, four, five decades from now, and you need to make those changes soon. And so I write the books because I wanna empower people. I want them to have this information to make those changes so they can live longer and better. Yes, I love that. And I, I picked that on, on for that particular reason that a lot of times people say, oh, well, my mom had this or my mom uh, or my my dad or or we have this going on in the family. And 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 because of your study and your book and and the way you describe it, we I like that that that's no longer applied and you can make these changes and you can change your path in a sense. So that's really great. I, I thought it was wonderful and helpful. Um, your book also mentions tennis being one of the sports most linked to longevity and the reason for it being a social factor of the sport and involving vigorous movement. Also that moderation factor with short bursts of exercise throughout the day and even better if it includes sharing the experience with others is the way to go. The book mentions a study about various sports and people who play tennis gain nearly a decade more of life. Can you elaborate on why that is? 
And then do you think that counts if someone ends up turning turning tennis into a profession at the highest level, like Andrea and other professional and also another professional athlete? <laughs> So it's a lot in that one, but it's pretty, yes. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, right? Is that, yeah, tennis is associated with longevity. You know, what's wild is what's associated with shorter lifespan are things like marathons. So people who push themselves, you know, and run 10, 20 miles or whatever, um, what happens is your heart starts to compensate and it starts to get bigger to beat more because you need it. And you can get cardiac arrhythmias and sudden death. And I don't know if you remember Jim Fix, who was one of the great marathon runners, died at an early age mm -hmm. because of that. Well, tennis has that stopping and starting and resting with all the other factors you apply to. Yes, it's associated with longevity. That doesn't mean people like Carlos Alcaraz and you watch how he plays. I look and go, there's no way he's going to have a career of decades. I mean, this kid is putting everything out there on every point, And it's kind of the opposite of this. Um, but I would have probably said that at Rafa and look at his career and how long it lasted. Um, you know, so I do believe that, you, you know, sports like tennis are great. I'm a believer also in that you want to do things that make you uncomfortable, that you're not good at. So I love playing tennis mainly because I'm not great at it. And it really challenges me and it enables my brain to focus on one thing only because I can't think of anything else then. And it really is a break for me playing tennis. Um, so I want you to focus on what you're not good at, not just what you're good at. And that's different than most people, right? I'm really good at this, so I keep doing this. It's really, you know, a, a mature thing is when you start to do things that you're not as good at, and it really makes that. But when you look at it, the human brain evolved to do pattern recognition and physical activity at the same time, right? Those, he or she who could uh, find their way from, out from a kill or hunting and gathering and find their way back to the village, so that physical activity with pattern recognition survived. Well, that's what tennis is, right? It's physical activity and pattern recognition. When they hit like this, that ball's gonna, you know, have an arc and it's gonna land over here, or that spin, it's gonna make it stop short. So I should run further up. And so it's amazing how it helps the human brain. Mm -hmm. and, and so that sport, there's a reason why people do better. And so I love it. I love to watch it. Obviously. You know, uh, Andrea, what she's done for the sport is amazing. I remember watching you play years ago, um, and obviously it motivated me and many other people of our generation to play more tennis, which is fantastic. Yes, that's wonderful. So that's that clarifies it. So it's 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 okay to be a professional athlete. It might turn out to be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, right, I mean, Andrea? It's, it's it's an amazing prognosticator of being success later in life, right? Yeah. You were able to do something, you know, all of you, and really focus on it and do well at it. And that enables you to, to really apply that skill to everything else. There's a reason professional athletes or athletes in college do better in other things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that makes sense. Absolutely. You have written numerous books and continue to contribute to your field of expertise in a tremendous way. Did you always want to be a doctor and specifically focused on helping adults and children who have cancer? How was your passion field initially, basically? You know, early on, mm -hmm. um, it was about a decade after Sputnik, you know, so Russia beat us in the space game. And so our country said, oh my gosh, we're not training the next generation of scientists because we lost here. And so they did some tests, and I was one of the kids who was chosen to be part of a program to really get into science at an early age. I was a geek. And so while other kids were out, you know, playing baseball, I was in the lab doing science. And so I developed that passion. And so when I went to university, I realized I wanted to be a doctor, and I wanted to be a cancer doctor because I wanted to be able to take things from the lab and apply it to patients right away. I wanted to take that risk and I wanted to really be able to do it almost in real time. And cancer is one of the few fields you can take what you study in the lab and bring to patients. So I went to Hopkins and I went with my uh, for my training and I went to the head of the program and I go, I wanna go into cancer. He looked at me and goes, you're smart. Why don't you go into cardiology or pulmonary? We can actually help people. Cancer is barbaric. It's giving poisons to people, right? These are chemicals that, you know, push people to the brink and then pull them back. You do something where you can help people more. And that doubled my resolve. I wanted to go into the field because at the time, cancer wasn't sexy, right? It, there weren't many medicines to use when I went into it. So I wanted to go into the field that needed me. I wanted to go into a field that would be sexy in the future where we could really create things my generation was really one of the first where lots of people started to go into this field 
and it started to change. We were able to sequence the human genome. So we can, in every cancer, look at what gene was the on switch and the on switch, off switch in the cancer. We can harness the immune system to attack cancer. We can molecularly target things. So it became an exciting field, um, but it really is a message for kids today. When you want to go into something, don't go into what's hot today. Go into what will be hot a decade or two from now, because that's when you're gonna have your impact. You know, John Kennedy made the proclamation, we're gonna put a man on the moon. And people thought he was crazy. But when you look back, that average age in missile command, right? Nine years later, Neil Armstrong stepped in the moon. The average age of missile command was 27 years old when Armstrong stepped on the moon. That means those kids were 18 years old when Kennedy made his proclamation. So no offense to the three of you, but the future of the impact on cancer and diseases isn't me or any of us. It's going to be that next generation. So they have to go into the field where we're going to need them. And that's what's exciting. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, I find that, that uh, you know, you're one of those people who really enjoys that challenge. And, and you know, like you explained at the, at the beginning, the fear, um, but the fear fueled you to go past that. And oh, thank you so much for sharing such a wonderful information. It was interesting what you said just now about that, how they were trying to steer you. You got steered a little bit away from it. The same thing happened to me when I went into it and I obviously didn't have your training or have the medicine part. It was trying to improve the lives of children with cancer. And I did four years of research before going in because I wanted to do something that would help, not just do something that was already being done great by someone else. And I talked to, I, I ran programs on my own money and went to hospitals, talked to doctors, nurses, social workers, child life specialists, families, and all the medical teams and the people in the hospital said, don't go into pediatric oncology. Stay away from children with cancer because it's too heart wrenching. We can't make it. We end up going into research. And so, it, exactly like you, it was almost like it fueled me to say, "Well, wait a minute. I just, you know, came from a professional tennis circuit. I I know how to get through things." And and that really helped me. And and one of the other things, especially in your book that I, I loved reading, was you had a section that says, "Embrace the weirdness of everyone, in, yourself included." And so I related to that on many levels. I was viewed differently growing up because of my tennis success. And then again, when I went into the foundation work, helping children with cancer, people were like that, you know, they, they weren't really applauding that at all and decades ago. This is, you know, 38 years ago. And so embracing differences is how I've always gone into spending time with the children, whether they're children with cancer, children in hospitals, shelters, orphanages, schools, and People can have, you know, they can be different for a variety of reasons. And so you bring attention to the importance of embracing differences. Where did you first notice that with you and why is that important? It's because, you know, you deal with a, a specialty and a demographic, even though you help overall health for all humanity, cancer, there's a lot of vis visible signs. You, you know, there might be a hair loss, there might be a leg loss, there might be some type of things. So you see that. But this is different. This is also what you are allowing people to do to have the freedom to understand that emotionally, if you have a passion and it's different, that might be okay too. I mean, you, you really treat as a whole for people. So how did that first happen for you to know that? You know, obviously it was an evolution. Um, you know, I was once at the Aspen Ideas Festival and Walter Isaacson, who wrote the amazing books on Steve Jobs, and he's got one on Elon Musk coming out. Walter said, I want to have Murray Gelman interview you on cancer. I said, Murray Gelman, he's probably the greatest living physicist, Nobel laureate. Why would he want to interview me? What, why would you put the two together? He goes, trust me. You know, so, you know, first I met with Murray for a couple of sessions. And this is, you know, this is one of the greats. He discovered the quark and string theory. So the first question you ask a great physicist is, did you ever meet Einstein? He goes, yeah, we were at a conference once and we went to a bar together. We actually got in an argument over relativity. I'm like, you got in a bar fight with Einstein? He goes, no, it wasn't like a bar fight. I go, you weren't a fight in a bar. It's a bar fight. It counts. Um, you, you know, this is the guy, when he interviewed me, at every question, he would ask these deep questions, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But underneath, it, he would write in his page, uh, remember to smile in capital letters. So the smartest man in the world needed to be reminded to smile. He would ask the questions, and look up like this. <laughs> um, 
But what he would say to me are things like, you know, in the cancer world, you always look at the average. What was the average response duration? What was the average response? You should be looking at the outliers, right? It's that one child who, you know, gets better almost immediately or that one child who doesn't respond to anything. Those are the ones you have to look at to learn from. You never learn from the middle. You learn from the outliers. He would say, sometimes in your field, you want to know too much. You know, it's like the climate modelers. They don't go up every day and measure 20,000 variables in the sky in a balloon. They actually just look at the shape of the clouds and it becomes a coarse grained element. It's a term from photography, right? You make the lens of the camera blur blurry. All I need to know, you know the outline of you're a human to know you're a human. I counted every hair on your head and your eyebrow and every pore on your face. It'd be so much data that it may even overwhelm your models. You just need to course train and then understand it. And it was this aha moment to me that, you know, different fields of, uh, look at the same data, the same problem in different ways. And so we really need to embrace how we're all different and use that, that diversity to approach problems. And so whether it be what you were trained in, whether it be your socioeconomic status or your race or others, we need all of us to look at those same problems. And we're going to get the answers that matter because we're all looking at it differently. Our brains are wired differently. You know, and we you hate to say that. It's politically incorrect to say. You know, my institute, it's about different disciplines working together. So not shockingly, women are much better at men, male brains. And this is a generalization. There are obviously you know, examples on both sides at doing multiple disciplines together. Men are very good at single disciplines. <clears throat> so we have to embrace how we're wired differently and use that together to get the best outcome. Because the goal you know, is not just to do science or to do medicine. The goal is to change how we do science and change how we do medicine. And in order to do that, we really have to think differently. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought up Quark because on my free time yesterday, I spent a two and a half hour study time on Quark. And, and I'm like, okay, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> we're, in, we're in tune here. Okay. So great awareness went into creating the Ellison Institute with natural healing aspects, hope and love, all while improving wellness, pioneering research, enhancing health and transforming lives. Do you notice clients and patients in your faculty being transformed just by walking in the healing environment of the Elliston Institute for Transformative Medicine? It must be because you can tell those things when a person walks in and they feel like, okay, something's happening here. Do you notice that with, with the people that, that come in? It's kind of funny. First of all, you call them clients. I mean, to me, uh, I mean, they're, they're just humans, patients. all humans. So, it, you know, Steve Jobs told me once, he sat me down, he goes, David, you're not going to wear a white coat when you see patients because it sets a, a difference between you and them. And you're both the same. Because if you're in a room and you sit down, they're going to perceive twice the amount of time than you stand up. And I want you to sit at a lower level than them because it shows that you have deference to who they are and you want to learn about their value system. He goes, I don't want a desk in your office. I want a table. So you're equal. A desk means I'm the professor and you're the student or you're the one who in a different position. And you don't want that. And we actually took them into heart as we designed the Institute. You know, the Institute is designed with a path in mind. So when a patient comes in, they actually walk by all the labs and the labs are all glass. So when a patient sees a researcher working, that's hope personified, right? That researcher is working on a cure, a new understanding of disease, a way to lessen suffering. And so I want every time a patient with a disease comes in for them to see people in the lab working on the cure so they know that there's teams of people across the globe working to help them. Well, when that researcher sees a patient suffering or talks to them, they work twice as hard. They get the meaning in what we're doing. All too often at universities, you've got the lab buildings and you have the clinic buildings and they're not together. And it makes no sense to me. When, you know, uh, the cafeteria or the, the coffee room where we all get together, you know, it's patients, it's doctors, it's researchers, it's artists all together as one, because I want those conversations to happen. One of my mentors was a guy named Andy Grove, who was the CEO of Intel, really the first computer chip company, amazing guy, Holocaust survivor, wrote the book, Only the Paranoid Survived, that literally changed management in Silicon Valley. This is a guy once that Steve Jobs and Larry Ellison went to his house for dinner. And they showed up early and they talked and they sat down with Andy and they said, 
Andy, you're the only person we actually respect and would work for because we're CEOs now, but that we would actually work for in Silicon Valley because you're so amazing manager. He looked at them both and goes, neither one of you are good enough to work for me. And he was serious. He was that kind of guy. But Andy used to get and tell, he used to sit the marketing person next to the uh, research person, next to the development person. He used to mix them all up. There weren't departments and floors of one versus another. He just put them all together because he wanted everybody to know what everybody else was doing. And that makes an impact and a difference. All too often, we're so subspecialized in our world that we forget that we need those interactions. You know, in COVID, we all got Zoomed away where we're all working from home. You know, we were all, you know, we forgot those human interactions. We forgot what happens, you know, in the hallways and the random meetings that actually lead to insight and advancements. And so we designed an institute with that in mind. And we're lucky to have worked with amazing architects, both here in Los Angeles and uh, in Oxford. Our Oxford architect is the same one who did the Apple spaceship campus, Norman Foster. He's 88 years old and literally one of the most amazing architects on the globe today. And he was just so engaged with every aspect about doing and creating those chance encounters, about building hope into every place you could stand in the Institute, that you're going to get a feeling and a look of hope about integrating the art and the science into the design of a building. You know, buildings aren't a place you do things. They're actually part of the work and they stimulate creativity. If you walk through our hallways, every color here is a color of nature. At every different place here, you can see gardens and see out to green. When you're in a room with colors in nature, your mind is relaxed and you're more creative. If you go into a room that's pink or orange or colors that aren't in nature, look how you feel. You're not relaxed. You're not as creative. And so there's something to, to being having natural wood. There's something to having gardens because our brains can actually do better whether you're a patient getting a treatment or whether you're a researcher trying to find a cure, the environment matters. Absolutely. Now, we both have a life of cancer work, love for playing and watching tennis, appreciation of animals, including Bernice mountain dogs, African safari animals, animals in general, and respect of nature. We even have a few friends in common. You live your own advice for a happier, healthier, and more fulfilling life. And you share that opportunity with everyone. Do you have a daily mantra or meditation or prayer that you can share that helps you? I do. And yeah, listen, Andrew, we do share a lot. I mean, when you sent me the email and said, first, do you want to be on the podcast? I literally happened to be with David Foster, who had just been on your podcast and told me how great all of you all were. He says, David, you have no choice but to do this. Um, so it's kind of a small world if you think about it. Um you know, my fear of failure, my fear of not living up to what my patients need um, or not getting things as quick to them as they could benefit from it is what drives me. And so I, I am sure every day I really do certain things and I schedule my day accordingly. I need downtime. You know, you need some downtime every day and that's where things sink in, right? If you work all day and you don't have that downtime, you're never going to get the sinking in of the memories and the neuronal connections you need to make that big advance. So downtime actually increases productivity. But I try to start every morning, you know, by really thinking with intention of what's going to happen during the day. And I try to plan. And I say, you, you know, my grandfather taught me this. He was an amazing man. He was a rabbi. He was a philosopher and a writer. And he said, you know, plan your day, your brain in the morning, is really the best it's going to be. You had that amazing deep sleep and you really have that focus and attention. So put in the morning, the things that matter, the things where you really have to be creative and make big decisions. Put in the afternoon, things you could do, you know, by rote, by in your sleep, if you will. And so I plan my day accordingly. And every morning I kind of look at my calendar and I say, where's my inspiration of the day going to come from? Because I need to be inspired to get things done. Where am I really going to make that difference? And I go over my calendar in such a positive outlook. And I really say, where are the good things going to happen? Because there are meetings that we all have to go through. And there are events that are not our favorite, but they're important. And we have to do them. And you need to be inspired at other points. And so I kind of build for my day the inspiration every morning by looking at that calendar and really planning it. Um, so it's not just, it doesn't just happen. It really is planned is where am I going to get that inspiration and where am I going to need it also? That's really well put. So many people have told me, gosh, you're 
life has to be so sad. You work with children with cancer and you've been doing it for, you know, decades and decades. And, and I'm like, no, you, you know, here's how I look at it. Every single moment that I wake up and even <laughs> I try to absorb it when I'm sleeping, like come up with a great idea or, or get some funding or, or something. You have the They're privilege of helping these kids. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I'm saying. It's, I, giving them optimism and hope. It's amazing. Absolutely. It's, it's like, I feel like I've, I've, it's such an honor to be in their life. Like I get the opportunity. It is an opportunity. And so I treat it as such. And so I'm so glad how you represent that because you, you answer the question about, you know, it's not every day do you get to give the best news to somebody, but there is news. There's something that you're collectively getting, you're called to, and you're brought together for, for the greater good that is going to make a difference for humanity. And so so it is, um, this has been really such an honor. Uh, I thank you for sharing the healing of nature and animals for people. And my Little Star Foundation programs, they started 38 years ago, and we've always included animals in them and nature because of their healing aspects. I've had um, the privilege of, of going to certain facilities and and learning about like what you did, talk to the experts, learn about the animals and the nature and see how you can incorporate them in with, with children. And it, it really we live in a world that's fascinating with animals with nature with people experiences and opportunities and so um, I just hope that this little starlight episode we can bring people to that already knew you have them have even a greater appreciation of you and and Larry Ellison and the Ellison Institute for Transformative Medicine because it it is changing humanity it's giving this opportunity for the world to learn. You, know, you have a show, whether it's a podcast, whether it's your books, the Institute, there's so many things, but the knowledge you have and the fact that you take the time to share it and give it and, and love it is, um, is an honor that we all benefit from. So I, I really thank you so much to you and um, may you and, and Larry Ellison and, and the faculty there that comes together with awe and inspiration every day, you know, following in, in with your guidance. Um, may they have blessings as well because you you certainly are doing blessings for the world so and to the audience too i want them to be blessed <laughs> <Damn straight. laughs> listen every person can offer something and you know my field at any point in juncture in healthcare in your medicine whether you have cancer whether you have any disease it's the right decision based on your own value system and so all too often my field has become clinical and algorithmic Right. And that's not what it is. My job as a doctor is not to make a decision for a patient. It's to learn their value system and together make the right decision for them. And so I'm excited because AI is really going to enable us to take the things that we consider art in medicine and make it much more of science and enable doctors to spend more time with patients. One of the great advances of AI is productivity. Many of the tasks that we have to do in medicine are going to be uh, basically automated. So I could spend more time with a patient to educate them. An educated patient has a better outcome. An educated patient has more hope. An educated patient is going to get and be able to do the things they want. Um, and that's what it's all about. And listen, you've all three of you put together a podcast about education, about providing hope, about providing inspiration to people. And that's what it's all about. So thank you all for what you do. And I truly am privileged. David Foster was right. You're all fantastic. Thank you thank so you. much. It's, thank it's thank a privilege. You. This was amazing. We, we know how AI is, it is, it's revolutionizing medicine and advancements and restructuring healthcare. And that's something that, that the Institute there that you're working with is so um, targeted for and, and to be able to provide, you're, you're boldly using it, but you're doing it with a vast array of sciences, with engineering and, and other sciences and disciplines. And, and so that's fantastic because that it doesn't only detect and treat disease, it prevents it. And that's something that is, um, you know, we're also so privileged to have. And, and the great thing about AI and you, it's a combination that benefits everyone because you, you know, AI can't do everything nor can you. And so when you put the combination together, it's like everybody benefits. I agree. So, yeah. So thank you so much. It's, a, it's just been such an honor.